I realized that year he didn't have any of his own cows and he had lost his government job and they were on the verge of not being able to be nomads anymore. So I bought him a cow. They'd been so good to me. Yes. So I bought him a cow. Yes. And when I went back the next year, his uncle took me aside and said, that cow has made it possible for no Piroji to become, and his family, to stay nomadic. And wow. talk about a profound moment yeah. for me. And I realized, you know, that one cow was $200. It was, it was a lot of money for me at the time, but it didn't change my life. It did change his. Yes. Yeah. So that's what started the foundation. <laughs> What's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Very excited to be in the beautiful Ojai, California. We are at the Nomad Gallery. We are gonna be speaking with Leslie Clark. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Leslie. Really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. And I couldn't help but ask Leslie to come on the show while we were visiting this beautiful area. Her gallery here is beautiful. Her story is beautiful. I'm very excited to be unpacking it, sharing it with you guys. For those who don't know Leslie's background, she is an artisanal gallery owner in Ojai, California and has traveled to Niger 50 times setting up general health education and economic support to indigenous nomadic people. And you can find the links in the bio to nomadgal.com as well as nomadfoundation.org. Okay, Leslie, let's start things off by asking you, who are you and what do you stand for? Well, I am, sometimes I forget this, but I'm first an artist. And that is my, what drives me. And that's what drove me to Africa the first time. And um, that when I first started, when I got my art education, a master's in, in fine arts, I started traveling at the same time. And I found that I absolutely loved to travel. And so I, uh, I went to the south of France to study, uh, to work on my masters. And I was painting um, plein air all around the, the, the Côte d'Azur. And I was, somebody saw the paintings I was doing and they asked me to do a show in Monte Carlo. And so I said, sure, it was my first show. I was really excited about it. And I sold a bunch of paintings and I thought, Wow, what a good gig. Travel, sell, paint what I see, and then try and figure out a way to sell the paintings so that I can earn enough money for the next trip. And so that became the pattern for my painting life. How did you get hooked into painting when you were younger? Well, it was always something that I knew I needed to do. I never had any, my high school didn't have art education, my grammar school didn't really, but my grandfather was a painter, an artist, a carpenter, and he would get out his little blackboard that was about this big and say, okay, draw circles, draw triangles, draw straight lines. And I would do all these things, and I was about five, six at the time. And I would do all these things, and my reward for doing them correctly was that he would draw me a horse. And it was such a treat to have him draw me a horse. So I, I just, from then I knew I, all, I had to draw. So I just kept drawing. And I never went into a formal education. And when I went to college, I thought, well, I'm going to be an artist. And at the time, there were no art schools that had life drawing classes. It was all abstract. So I didn't know what to do. I thought, I don't really wanna, I wanna learn you know, anatomy and how to paint from the old masters and all that, and nobody was teaching that at the time. So I kind of got you know, distracted and went off and did some other things for a few years. And then my parents died and I, uh, and at the same time, I got a divorce, and at the same time, my ranch burned down, and so it was like z z ground zero, nothing wow. left of my formal life. So I, I said, I am going to be an artist now. So I went back to school and got my degree. I ended up halfway through that degree meeting the man that would become my future husband and I moved to the East Coast because I thought hey I can get a great I can get a great education here 
found the best program I could have found. It was based on, on methods and materials of the masters and I lived in Washington mm -hmm. DC and I got to go to all the fabulous museums when there was nobody there and learn about uh, the and paint from the old masters and we had a, a course that just totally transformed and made my painting life and that was called methods and materials and from that course we were required to paint using the materials and the methods of every major uh, trend in art throughout history so I would start with the Byzantine altarpieces, and that's what really struck me. I, today, my painting reflects a lot of gold leaf, a lot of sculptural elements that are carved into gesso, and this is what the Byzantine altarpieces were, or illuminated manuscripts with gold leaf and very intricate mm -hmm. borders. And all of those things continue to inform my work. My work doesn't, isn't religious and it's not the same subject matter, now it may be floral or it may be a camel in Africa, but it's got those elements of the Byzantine and and I went all the way through and painted in egg oil tempera and painted in, in uh, techniques that the masters used. And, and one of my, one of my uh, projects was to paint a portrait. I, portraits have always been what I was really, people is what I, I've always been interested in. And so I painted a portrait of a friend in all of my favorite artist styles. I did John Singer Sargent, and I did Degas, and I did Klimt, and I did Raphael, and I did in those in their styles. It was so much fun. <laughs> so portraits ended up being in all these different styles. This it was methods and methods and materials. Materials, and cool. it just made me learn how to. We would grind our own pigment. We would, it, it nice. made me learn how to use anything and it made me conversant in those materials. So, yes. so whether, no matter what I chose to paint in, whether it was pastels or, to, or um, tempera or casein or uh, now I paint in acrylics and oils and a lot of watercolors when I travel but uh, I, I'm comfortable with it all, and that gave me that ability, that wonderful class. That seems like something that every aspiring artist should endeavor into. That's a Absolutely. beautiful start. Yeah. And the, the wonderful thing they did is even art history majors had to take that class. So historians and critics would be conversant in what these artists go through. And it's, it, was, it was a very transformational and wonderful moment in my early uh, painting life. And then how did you decide to make the, the trip? So you were in DC, and then how did you decide to go to the, uh, the west coast of Africa and start painting portraits of indigenous? How did that happen? Well, I, uh, it was kind of a process. I was painting in... Um, uh, in the Mediterranean area for years. I was doing this pattern of traveling to paint and, uh, and then, you know, having some kind of show so I could earn enough money and figure out where the next trip was going to be. And I did that for many years. And then um, uh, I, my husband and I decided to move back to my home of Ojai, which I was born here, and it was um, where I lived a lot of my life, even though my father traveled around a bit. Um, but we moved back here and were thinking that we might sell my house that I had built when I was in my early 20s and uh, that was an whole other side of my life. I'm kind of a, an architect in, in <laughs> many, I've built six houses now. Cool. Anyway, but I just love being creative. I yes. love design. So where was I? I was talking, trying to get to Africa. It's great, like you just described also that you, you know, not only do you have your hands in things like design and architecture as well, um, that helps with the artistic edge, but also I just want to mention, I didn't actually know that so you actually went to Mediterranean uh, also beforehand, a couple t visits. Uh, many times. And you I were doing did. this process of going there, painting, uh, uh, portraits and then selling those to fund your next exactly it's such a cool process it what it's not exactly portraits it's people doing what they do uh -huh. so in the Mediterranean Candid. it would be 
sitting in cafes or at the beach or fishing or doing what they do. So a lot of times I'll focus on a face because I love to paint people's faces and try and, and capture the personalities. But a lot of times it'll be somebody as in Africa, you know, riding on a camel or drawing water from a well or um, embroidering, doing the things, braiding somebody's hair. And, and the process of that is I have to paint, I paint rather large paintings. And when you travel, you can't lug around a 48 by 72 canvas. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to figure out what is going to be possible. And for me, it was watercolor. I painted small watercolors and journaled. So I'd write about what I was seeing and feeling and, yes. and sketch it. So I got very adept at watching people who were moving around and capturing what they were doing because e most posing is, you know, somebody sitting still. Uh. But that's not necessarily communicating who that person is. So their activity and their body language and the way the, and what they're interested in doing mm -hmm. communicates more for me. Yes. Um, and so that I would go to a, a port in Greece and watch the fishermen. And this guy will be over there and he's working on his nets and, and I'll look at him and I kind of ca I, take a mental photograph, and then I sketch it. I won't look at him again until I finish that sketch because it will confuse me yes. because he's moved. So that's my technique of capturing some kind of activity in a quick sketch. Now the sketch might be terrible, but if I look at what I've done, I remember it. I mm -hmm. can smell it. I can feel the temperature. Yeah. It is all captured in those silly, ugly lines that I've drawn in my journal. But I have to do that in order to get to the painting. Yes. Yes. Okay, so there's a mental um, snapshot of in, in action, uh, a human on the planet that's in action with the process that they're, um, in, that they're doing, that they may be in, in love with doing, and that then um, that, that, first of all, is much different than like you were describing a portrait of just position. Um, it catches, it catches them in their essence of what they do. And then also, like you said, okay, so you capture this men mentally as a photograph and then you bring it into your sketchbook and you don't look back, you just you sketch that out and then you, from there, you decide whether or not you want to take that to canvas. Mm -hmm. And usually, I mean, if it's in a quick, in my journal, I may take it to a small or a little bit larger watercolor that's somewhat more detailed first. But I'll never take it to canvas while I'm traveling. That happens once I get back into my studio. So um, I will do uh, maybe several sketches, a couple of small watercolors of a subject matter, or maybe one, uh, just depending on the time, because people aren't going to stand around and keep doing what they're doing so that I can draw them. Um, but there's always something that, and I sometimes don't know whether it's going to be a big painting until I get back and I kind of get into what I've, yeah. what I've done. Sometimes I know immediately this is going to be the painting from this trip, oh, the cool. major painting, sometimes. Cool. Yeah. And, uh, and then can you, um, so, then, so sometimes you add watercolor. Um, and then you bring them back and you pick out of the ones that you've sketched in your notebook, which ones in your studio in Ojai that you want to turn um, onto canvas. Mm -hmm. And then you share that moment that you captured ar across the planet um, mm -hmm. with other people that come to your gallery and decide to bring that into their home, that, the, those moments, and mm -hmm. kind of bring the world closer together through that process. Exactly. exactly. It's beautiful. And then how many would you say that you, um, out of the, um, the total, if you go on a trip for, is it a couple weeks, how many um, examples of, of, of uh, sketches would you make and then how many of those would you turn to canvas? Um, I would, when I was, you know, on a trip of maybe, I'd usually go for three weeks or so and I'd probably do, um, oh, 50 sketches in my journal. Mm -hmm 
probably uh, 40 larger mm. watercolors and then I'd come back and maybe do 10 to 15 uh, larger pieces. <laughs> That's so neat. And then would you let the, the people coming to the gallery know that he, by by supporting this artwork, you were funding my next travels to, <laughs> yeah, to absolutely. go back? Absolutely. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And so, yeah, how did the transition then happen? How many times did you go to the Mediterranean, and then how did it come up to go to West Africa? Well, I um, moved back from, uh, my education was in Washington, D.C. I moved back to Ojai, built a, uh, a home or moved back into a home I'd already built but I had met my now husband and he moved back here and we at first I thought we'd probably move back to the East Coast because he's an East Coast person and I thought oh he's not going to adapt to this because he is a horseman and that's his passion. Mm. We get along very well because he lets me be, be who I am and I let him be who he is and sometimes we'll be apart from each other for six months of the year <laughs> but it's because we understand that each other has something that is really who they are and yes. important. So um, we, move, we moved out here to uh, Ojai to sell the house that I'd built um, uh, before and he totally fell in love with Ojai, totally fell in love with being a horseman cowboy instead of a polo playing, fox hunting, steeplechasing, east coast guy on a horse, and, um, and totally adapted. He, he couldn't possibly leave Ojai. Now he's more Ojai than I am. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we decided to, um, we had put the, the, the house on the market, found a good buyer and we decided to build another house to sell that one and build another one that was more oriented toward my having me having a studio mm -hmm. and a place to display paintings and um, so for a while I started traveling closer by when I moved to California getting to the Mediterranean was a schlep it was a long way and also if I was building a house I didn't want to go too far and so I started traveling in Central America well, I had a show of a, uh, a series I'd done from Guatemala, and a woman came up and said, you know, I love this painting. Would you have any interest in painting, in trading for a trip, a river rafting trip between, on the river, the Usmacinta, which is between Chiapas and Guatemala, and, and, and it's basically to visit the Mayan ruins. Wow. And I was, of yeah. course. Yeah, yeah. And so I, uh, uh, we agreed on that. I took the trip, and uh, entering the Mayan ruins from the river is the way to do it, because that's the way they were built. All of these phenomenal plinths and, and temples that have all these beautiful carvings, it, they are facing the rivers. The little airports that there, you come in the back door if you arrive in the jungle in an airport and can come through in a jeep. But entering it, seeing it by river is just spectacular because they are built to impress and from the river. So did the river trip, painted a, uh, <laughs> this, is, yeah, this is a long story, but we'll eventually get to Africa. Mm -hmm. I love this story, <laughs> uh, keep going. Um, it, I, I saw a man in this jungle, viney temple that was a ruin, and there was a guy with this long black hair and a white tunic, and he just kind of flitted through and disappeared, and then I saw him again. And I asked my guide, who is this guy? And he said, oh, that's a Lacandon. They, they, are, they live here, and this temple is their sacred site, but they're not really allowed to be here because the government re reserves it for tourists. And I'm going, what? Well, it was obvious he was using it anyway. He uh -huh. was there. And so I did a painting of this guy. I did a really quick sketch, and I did a painting. And I was invited back the next year to Palenque to a group of Mayanists who were, um, at the time, deciphering the Mayan glyphs, kind yes. of, you know, like the Rosetta Stone and the... Yes. Uh, 
uh, and they were doing it through the connection with the Lacandones because the Lacandon had never been affected by the Spanish conquest. Uh. They were in the jungle, not wealthy, small tribe, so they were speaking the same language. So they understood what the, they provided the link that wow. helped these people translate. Anyway, that's a digression. I go to, I take this huge painting I'd done of this Lock and Don Man, and I'm exhibiting it in this, uh, this hall along with other paintings I'd done of the Mayan ruins. And this man walks in to the, and he's got long black hair and a white tunic. And he walks up to the painting and he says, that's my brother. Mm -hmm. And I, <laughs> yeah. so I yeah. met him. He was to be the next chief. Here he is in totally out of his element. He's this rainforest guy and he's in with all these Western, you know, European and American scientists and, and he's just cruising along comfortable, doesn't speak any language that, you know. So anyway, I, I was so fascinated by him that I asked my, a guide to, to see if he would let me follow him around in the rainforest for a couple of days so I could paint him. Yes. And he did. Wow. And so I spent a few days just, you know, creeping around. I felt like an elephant in the rainforest right. as he just totally silent, silent, you know, yeah. going through, because there's, there's all of these, you know, vines everywhere, and, and uh, anyway, so uh, I, I did that, and it was, and it painted a whole series of this guy, and was set to go back to the same convention the next yeah. year, and there was an uprising, the Zapatista <gasps> uprising, oh, and I couldn't go back. That was the Zapatista uprising? Yes. So I, I had this time set aside, I had money saved, and I thought, you know, where am I going to find indigenous people that have, I want more of this. I want to be, to, to figure out why the, he was so comfortable with who he was, yes. out, totally out of his element. Yes. Why wasn't he scared? Why wasn't he nervous? He was just, I am who I am. And, I, and yes. then as I, I was so comfortable with him yes. on our days in the rainforest, I wanted so more cool. of that. So. I decided Africa was the deal, and that's what led me there. And I had seen a book by Carol Beckwith called Nomads of Niger, mm -hmm. and I wanted to meet those people. Mm. They were, um, but the, the, the kind of, part of it was this, this spiritual thing that I had felt that I had had with him, but it was also, I wanted just exotic subject matter to paint. Well. I finally got to Niger and and met, uh, I'd found a woman who had been there before and we went together. And the first nomad I ever met, there was a big rebellion going on. I couldn't get into the north to meet the Tuareg nomads, but I could meet the Wadabi, which is the group that Carol Beckwith's book was about, mm -hmm. Nomads of Niger. And they have this beauty contest where the men compete and the women judge. <laughs> and they, it's um, the men in their culture, the men, men can't propose to a woman. It's a marriage festival, but the guys can't propose. They have to make themselves so irresistible uh -huh. that the women propose to them. And that's what this beauty contest is all about. And, but I didn't know, I was trying to find this contest because I'd seen it in the book and it took a couple years because <laughs> <laughs> there was a rebellion going on, and we couldn't get north. They were they were shooting at us, and and at the, or at the military that were blocking us. That we didn't actually get shot at that trip, but um, it was uh, uh, it was a process. And when I finally did get to them, I it, it transformed my life. I became I from '93 on. I've been back to Niger for every year at least twice, sometimes three times, and for as much as six months in the year. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> this is so cool. Okay, so let's, um, let's briefly mention um, the visit um, to the, the Mayan ruins um, through the uh, river. And mm -hmm. uh, what was the um, indigenous that was there in the black and white? What was the name of the... Um, indigenous uh, uh, Lacandon. Lacandon. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you, and then when you went to the 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 Mayan um, 
the congregation that was happening with some of the experts that were looking at the glyphs that mm -hmm. that someone said that it's my brother there mm -hmm. and then that's so neat how that happened then you went into the rainforest uh, for three days following um, the Lakondon to, to be chief mm -hmm. Kayum was his name Kayum mm -hmm. whoa see that right there in itself is such a profoundly life-changing experience um, following Kayum for three days mm -hmm. in the um, in in the rainforest and watching how Kayum moves and uh, treats that like a native thing and <laughs> we're trying to like you know, follow and be all like awkward in the rainforest. Well, the <laughs> other thing that was really striking is I would always ask about the plants. There were so many plants. I mean, this yeah. is a jungle. This yes. is a rainforest. And I would say, well, so what's that? And they'd say, Silvestri. So I finally, and everything was Silvestri. It turns out that that meant wild. <laughs> okay, so they don't name their plants, but uh -huh. they can tell you what everything's used for. Okay. Oh, so when you ask about a plant, <coughs> they won't have a name for oh. it. They would, oh, that's the plant that cures headaches. Or that's the plant that's good for your stomach. Or that's the plant that you rub on a wound. And that's how they would always describe So they plants. know visually uh, by the specific healing process that the plant helps with. Yeah, right. we're so lost. Yeah. Here in the United States, we know all of our logos, and but we don't can't name a couple different plants or <laughs> trees or flowers. Well, we're oh, pretty man. isolated from that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's. Okay, and I can see how this like hooked you um, into wanting to go. Um, okay, and the book was on uh, um, Nomads of Niger was the mm -hmm, book. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then um, it's the Wud Wuda Wudabi Wudabi Wudabi, and um, first of all. A nomadic uh, is that's that 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 in itself is much different than a lot of other in indigenous have a home um, that they have to live nomadic. in, and so nomadic's different than that. But then also, like you said, there's these cultural processes of indigenous heritages that I think are so beautiful. Like, so there's this festival where the men dress up and have a co competition for the women to propose to them. <laughs> So things like that are completely uh, different, and so it's very unique, and it's cool to be a process of that. So the first trip was in 93, mm -hmm. and at least two to three times a year since then. Mm -hmm. And um, tell us about, yeah, these first times that you started going out there, and then, and then we'll get into more on the general health clinics side of things. Okay, so I um, met this nomad. His name was... Piroji, and he had a large family. Uh, most nomads do. They move with, you know, the, no the Wadabi can have four wives, and Piroji was so handsome and so charming that he had more than his allotted four. But they, once I asked him <laughs> down the road after I got to know him pretty well, and I learned their language and all this, <clears throat> I asked him how many wives he'd had, and he said, well, I think maybe three. 32, but only eight stayed more than two weeks. <laughs> so that's it. Um, anyway, I, the first family that I met on that first trip became my, my family for years. And I traveled back to see them. I would arrange, because they don't have a house, the second time I didn't, the, the first time I met them, they were just so lovely, and they were, they, we couldn't get into the north where those dances that I was just dying to see were. So the kids, all the young men and women who were of that age that would be in those competitions were be behind the reb rebel lines, so we couldn't go there, and I was just devastated. But the kids who were like between eight and 12 years old, weren't quite old enough to be in the competitions, they did all the dances for us and they made up for us. And they, and they would go out and all night long they'd be singing and they were so excited because we were there. And they would do this kind of their version and it was so <laughs> wonderful. I thought, you know, this is what childhood should be. I always felt sad that the people, that my 
I mean, in my childhood, I could ride my bike anywhere. I could, my parents would let me, you know, walk down the street by myself. It's kind of not the case anymore. And I felt so sad for kids of our world today. They've got everything. They've got food and and shelter and wealth and comforts, but they don't have freedom. Mm. And these kids, as long as they got up in the morning to do their chores, and they knew they had to, when you're up until about five years old, you can do anything you want, and you're just adored, and everybody coddles you, and that's, but five on, you have chores. Mm. And, but they could stay up all night if they wanted to, as long as they got up and did their chores. Mm. So they would have, and their big brothers would, you know, protect them from the snake that might bite them, or, I mean, it was such a free, you know, fabulous life for a child. And I got a little taste of what the festivals were going to be like, because they would sing the, the, the songs and, and recreate these for us. And I was so pleased with the visit. And we, the, the head of the family, Feroji, took us around to visit other families. And there were some little mm -hmm. celebrations, not the big, the big deal, which I got to the next year. Mm -hmm. But when it came time to leave, I didn't realize how poor they actually were. They mm -hmm. didn't have any cows. They had just been through a major drought in West Africa. The 80s mm -hmm. decimated all the herds in West Africa. And this family were trying to hang on to being nomads, but he had just gotten kind of a, a job out of his regular territory. That's why I was able even to meet him, because normally the nomads would all have been farther north, Whoa. and he was planting trees for the government. And this was a, not a kind of a normal thing for him, but he didn't have anything else, um, and he had no animals. And but they would do they would do anything for us. He came along and took me to other friends so I could meet other uh, other Wadabi. And so when I left, I organized uh, a way for to communicate with him. And he said, "Well, um, he doesn't know how to write." But he has somebody in the town where we could maybe, the nearby nearest town, which was like a four hour drive away, a, a week by their, you know, or several days by donkey. But we took him into the town, showed him the post office, how to mail a letter. Uh, he introduced me to the person that could write a letter for him. This is such a complicated Whoa. means of communication. There were no cell phones or anything right. like that in the day. So I, um, uh, I came back thinking, am I ever going to get back to see this? You know, it just, it was so deep in my heart. And of course, I came back and started painting. I did mm -hmm. so many paintings of Pierogi. I did paintings of all of his kids and his wives and, and the herds. And it was just every time I was doing a painting, I was there. <laughs> And so I knew I had to get back, yeah. but I didn't have a clue how to find him. Yeah. But I kept, I kept trying to communicate by letter. I never got a letter back, but I was writing and saying, okay, I'm going to be here on a search and such and such a date. Yes. And can you meet me? And Leap of faith. So I get back the next year. I go to the house of the person that was supposed to write the letters. And uh, Pierogi had never gotten any of them. So he didn't know I was coming back. So we start cruising around in the bush looking for a nomad. And, and the guide Gosh. kind of knew what their, I mean, he, he's the one that took me the first time. So he knew what their housing looks like. They call them Worrell, which is house. But it's a arced root thing with mats on it. And, so he kind of knew what a Wadabi camp would look for, like, and we, we went around and went around for a couple of days asking, and nobody had heard of Pierogi. And so we're driving down, and there's a guy walking down the, the, the road, and um, we stop and ask, because there's nobody around, so anytime you see anybody, you ask them what you need to know. So you, <laughs> we asked this guy, and he said, oh yeah, I know Pierogi, he's my cousin. So, so he said, and yeah, he's at a big festival, and I'll take you. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. So, I Singular. I got there. Uh, we 
we went through another several hours of driving through the bush. And the problem for nomads is they don't have cars. So they'll say, oh, well, just, it's just over here. But the car can't get over that big gully or can't. So you really are, you're going to take a whole different route than they would be able to normally, you know, because they can walk and, they will, and their camel can go places where the car can't go or their donkey can't. Yeah. So anyway, we eventually get to this place and I see all of these guys in a line and there's these tall feathers and there's a lot of dust and there's herds milling around and I hear some chanting and then I look over and here comes Pierogi and he's clapping and he's so excited. excited yeah, yeah. So it's like, how could this have happened? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, needless to say, over the years, getting to find the nomad that you want to find has always been a challenge. Okay. I, I commu developed a means of communication with a guy who had it, in those days it, you had to go to a telecenter to make a phone call. So there was a guy at this place, he would help Pierogi make a phone call to me and that way I could find out, we could arrange where I would meet him on, on, at a roadside yes, somewhere. Yes. Well, one time I went back to meet him and we went to find his family and he couldn't find them. He's the head of the household. <laughs> He's the nomad. He's the head of the household and he can't find his own family. So think how hard it is for us to yeah, find yeah. these <laughs> folks. So he's looking for a couple days to yeah, find yeah. his family. Yeah. And so we asked everybody, nobody had seen him. But <laughs> when he leaves, his wives or his oldest son or whoever makes the decisions, and often it's the woman, they've got to go f where there's pasture because the herds aren't going to survive. If So in those days, I thought it was these were his cows. They weren't. It was an extended family group, and they help each other out. So his... Mm -hmm. His uncle was letting Pierogi's family kind of live off of the milk from his cows. I realized that year he didn't have any of his own cows and he had lost his government job and they were on the verge of not being able to be nomads anymore. So I bought him a cow. They'd been so good to me. Yes. So I bought him a cow. Yes. And when I went back the next year, his uncle took me aside and said, that cow has made it possible for no Pierogi to become, and his family, to stay nomadic. And wow. talk about a profound moment yeah. for me. And I realized, you know, that one cow it was $200. It was, it was a lot of money for me at the time, but it didn't change my life. It did change his. Yes. So that's what started the foundation. <laughs> and I knew I had to start asking so cool. people for help because I couldn't yeah. buy too many cows and I didn't, but I knew that my link between them and here and people with money and willingness to be generous would, could make a difference to their lives. <laughs> so cool. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it's, it's yeah. How how does one even uh, find if the if the if pierogi can't find uh, <laughs> exactly. the family? Uh, it takes several days to find this nomadic family. Uh, good luck you going and, and trying yourself. And you did, and you made this tie. And I think it's so beautiful that um, if there's a way to find um, people around the world that um, lives can be uh, changed um, so that their uh, original traditions can be uh, upheld. Uh, uh, through the uh, generous contributions of people from around the world that get, like you were the link, the, the middle connector mm -hmm. piece between the two. And so, okay, so then, um, so the, the animal, the cow, acts as a, a source of food for them uh, through the milk, mm -hmm. and then also as um, they have to take it to pasture, and that's what keeps the nomads moving so the cow can continue eating some exactly. of the... Okay, mm -hmm. okay. And then, um, and then, so you're also nomadic when you're there for several mm -hmm. I, months. I was determined to, when I first went and met the family, I was with a guide who was from another ethnic group. Nomads are not considered to be, none of them are educated at the time they weren't. 
and they're kind of considered by the educated people, the people that can drive cars and have, be guides in the agencies, as barbarians. So he interpreted things between myself and Perogi's family that were coloring what, how he wanted me to believe these people were. They weren't what they were actually saying. So I started right away, I didn't know this then, I found it out after I learned the language. So I started, and they were so wonderful at helping me learn the language. There, are no, there were no dictionaries. I just made my own dictionary, and I'd point cool. at things, and they'd tell me this. And, and, um, and they, were, they were so helpful that I would, okay, Fulfulde is this weird language that has all these noun classes. And if you want to describe a beautiful flower, the word for beautiful is different than if you're saying a beautiful house or mm. beautiful land because it's a different noun class. Mm. So the word beautiful isn't beautiful every mm. time. Every it's time. a whole different word depending yeah. on what it's modifying. Yeah. So that really confused me. And so I just use the same word d d yeah, no yeah. matter what yeah, yeah, noun yeah, class yeah, it was. Yeah. And so they would repeat my mistakes so I would understand what they were saying. <laughs> I eventually got good enough so I, I knew they were, they were not speaking correct full, full, full day, <laughs> but they were doing it so I would understand and, and they were trying to help me. It was, it was so, so charming and, and delightful on their part. But um, I decided I wanted to be on my own and I wanted to learn what it was like to migrate. So I arranged, the one thing I needed to have was good water. And so I had uh, a car drop me off with, you know, five, five gallon jerry cans of water that we could carry on our camels. And um, other than that, I just had a mattress and a, I didn't have a tent, I just had a mattress and a mosquito net and, um, and I'd ride on the camel every day and we'd stop at a new place. And, and the thing that you, if you find a, re a really good place is one that has shade. Because yeah. we're in the Sahara Desert. Yeah. So it's gonna be at least 100 deg degrees every day. In April, it's 140. I didn't go again in April. I went only once. I didn't want to do the 140 thing again. But Whoa. I was, um, when I, I was, we were migrating, it was sometimes there wouldn't be shade. So they would, they, they, there's a plant, it's, kind, it's a kind of milkweed. They would arrive at a spot and within 10 minutes they had harvested these little, these little sticks with leaves and made a shade shelter called the room faru and we would stop and we'd be able to have shade because you really can't not have shade yeah, yeah. in that yes. part of the world yes, yes. so and the thorn trees don't provide great shade but the wadabi pin their blankets under uh, under yes. the tree so that it's dense shade instead of just little thorny yes yes you know, well, yeah, yeah, the, the skills that can be uh, gained from, uh, from spending time with indigenous people like that, that's so interesting. Yeah. And then, so then, what was it like then, um, as you are visiting um, you know, several times a year, you're spending months at a time with them, you're learning more their language, you're making your own dictionary, this type of neat things. Then, when did it kind of come up that, um, that you could potentially uh, not only um, help you link with, um, with support uh, to preserve their, uh, their culture, but also um, uh, some of the general health um, things that were coming up. Yeah. Well, it really, the Wadabe were very, they're the only, they're a part of a, a large uh, ethnic group, the Fulani, but they've kind of split off and they're the only truly nomadic. So, and they're pretty isolated and almost none are educated. So the key to doing, taking more steps was to meet the Tuareg. The Tuareg is another nomadic group. The Wadabi uh, are more in the south. They have cattle and, and, and 
uh, sheep mostly, and there's m more pasture land. The Tuareg are desert people, and they're desert warriors, and they have camels and goats because that, those animals live can live in the more arid north where where it's uh, a lot of sand and not as much pasture land. But and I had wanted to meet them the first trip, but I couldn't go because of this rebellion. Well, the next trip, uh, we were allowed to go. And I went, uh, but we had to go in a convoy that was, that was guarded, that was led by armed vehicles. So we went up into the north to Agadez. And the woman that I was with had known this man who had, been, had started the main tourist agency in the area. Um, he was a Tuareg, and he was the rebel leader. So the rebellion was still going on, and uh, she found a way to meet him. We'd travel up into, the, into this very remote area, and, and we look over, and here comes this, this convoy of vehicles with 50 calibers on their roofs and, and all these you know, turbaned guys, and, we're all, uh, and I'm going like this, and it's him. It's Monodiac. And he was the most charming, cosmopolitan, guy and he sat down at our table and told us his story and he said and I was with this kind of semi-tourist group and my friend Irma at the time and we were going to just stay a day and then go back but uh, and I had some extra time and he invited me to go along and meet his rebels and travel through the desert Nobody else was able to go there at the time because they controlled the desert and there would be battles. So I said, yes, yeah, sort of. another <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, he was a very charming and very competent guy. So I, um, he said, well, you have to, oh God, there, I've got so many stories to tell, I'm going to out. <laughs> I, I love this. These are such good stories. Uh, so he said, well, come back and meet be in Agadez on such and such a day, but don't stay in Agadez because it will be suspicious if you wait around. They might think you're trying to help me. Oh. And so the people that were the foreigners that were there at the moment, the government thought, might, because the Tuareg were very uh, connected to the French and to white people in general, this especially through Mano Dayak, who was who had gotten his education in France and America, and he was trying to negotiate the peace through the white people, the Whoa. French and the Americans. But um, the government did not like that at all, and so they had this blockade on anybody leaving town that that could be. S providing them with gas or supplies or whatever. Yeah. So he said, don't stay in Agadez. Yeah. Just wait and just do something and then come back and meet me on such and such a day yeah. and I will send a driver in and he will take, take you out and that way you can meet us. Yeah. So what am I gonna do? Where do I go? So I got a guide who was gonna take me by camel to a wedding that was about a day and a half trip to out of Agadez. So <laughs> he was recommended by somebody. So I thought, well, this is probably OK. I've never been on a camel before. So <laughs> we, we go out, and we're traveling along. And, and, and it's, you know, it's about oh, four or five hours on the camel. And it's just you know, this kind of rubbly, wadi, well, it's a dry riverbed kind of thing that we're going through. And, and he said, do you want to stop and have lunch and, and take a break? And I'm going, yeah. So we stopped. And I didn't know. I mean, there was no, this is the middle of nowhere. Yeah. I am in the middle of nowhere. nowhere. Yeah. And he says, just uh, excuse me a minute. I have to go behind the bush. Uh, but if my, cam my camel isn't as well trained as yours, so if he uh, jumps up, grab his rope. Don't let him run away. And I said, OK. And so he goes behind the bush. Of course, the camel jumps up. I grab the rope, and the camel pulls and there, and the rope is attached by a ring in their nose. He pulls loose, 
and goes running off, and here I am holding the rope while I grab my camel, who's very well behaved, and he's staying there. And, the, and I go, Mosa, Mosa, come and chase the camel, he's disappearing. He goes running after the camel and s realizes very soon that the camel is going to outrun him. Yeah. So he comes back and grabs my camel no <laughs> and takes off. And you're stuck waiting there. Uh, yeah. uh, so what do I have? He has my food, my water, my I have a mat, and I have my sketchbook. Yay! <laughs> so I'm sitting there under a thorn tree and, you know, writing in my journal and sketching and waiting for Musa to come back. An hour goes by, two hours goes by, and I'm going, all right, I'm going through all these things. How? What, how am I going to get out of here? Yeah, yeah. I can't really start walking now because it's so hot, hot and I have no yeah, water. Yeah. I will die. Yeah. How long does somebody take to die? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm going through all these things, yeah. these mental things. And then I, or, well, should I wait until it's dark? Well, I won't be able to see the tracks when it's dark. Mm. Oh, you know, I'm going through those. So have I just stepped into the thing that's going to finally, you know, be yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Oh my <laughs> be the God. end? Yeah. And then this little creaky old man comes walking up, and he's, you know, toothless, and he's got no shoes on, and he just comes over, and he's turbaned and robed. He comes over and, and nods at me and sits down next to me. And I'm thinking, well, if he's here, yeah. he knows where other people are. Yeah. Yeah. He knows I'm a white person. I don't survive well out here. He, he will know how to help me. I couldn't talk to him. But I knew I, he was my guardian angel. I knew I was safe. Whoa. It took me, it took Musa four hours to get back. It was almost dark, but by the time oh, he got he back, got but back. he got back. He got back to the, yeah. so the, it must have taken him like two hours, one direction almost yeah. to like yep. get the camel. Yep, he got, the camel had gotten all the way back to Agadez running. <laughs> and, and so, um, so I lived to tell the tale. And we went on Whoa. to the, and I asked Musa about the guy, and he said, well, he lives around here. I don't know who he is. But I always thought this, that yeah, yeah. that made me know yes. that I was, that I was okay. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Otherwise, you were running all of the possibilities oh, in your yes, head. Yeah, all yes. the simulations. Okay, and then, um, <clears throat> then you went to the wedding, and then... Um, and the wedding was really okay. phenomenal. And then I got back into Agadez. This guy comes to meet me and says, okay, you know, come on, we're gone. The driver comes. And he drives a couple hours and then somebody else comes to meet me. He drops me off in this little spot and somebody else comes to meet me there, takes me out and eventually I get out to Mono and the Rebels. And I'm there Whoa. with all of these. I mean, and I am so naive at this moment. Yeah. Right now I'm kind of, I'm kind of used to traveling with <laughs> armed folks, but <laughs> not, that, not in those days. <laughs> I'm just kind of wide-eyed, but yeah. Mano was so competent and 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 charming, and I could hardly speak French even, you know, so I couldn't even talk to these people hardly. Yeah. But he wanted people to understand what they were fighting for. He's we weren't. This isn't some stupid armed insurgency. We're fighting for the survival of our culture. And he told me the whole story of why they were doing it, and and he was such a brilliant guy. Whoa. The the people, it's they were they're illiterate. They don't have telephones and radio, you know, and radios and televisions and all that. So he devised a way of communication. Music was really important to them. Mm -hmm. He brought in guitars. Mm. The guys. The whole generation of rebels learned, all, uh, many of them learned how to play the guitar, and they wrote songs that explained where to go, what to, you know, what, that they were fighting for their survival of their culture. This is, and if you're going to join us, come to this spot. And it was all kind of in code, but everybody understood it, and they sent it from camp to camp in cassette tapes, in boom boxes. And that's how they communicate. Whoa. Eventually, the government banned the music, made it m way more popular because they banned it. But it, the entire generation of, of musicians, of, of young men, knew how to play and sing the, all of these songs. And the songs became 
just legendary. And I became, I got eventually connected to many of the musicians, and I brought them over to Ojai. Whoa. And the first group was, one guy was a nephew of Mono, Dayak, mm -hmm. and, um, and his cousin came with him on the second trip, and they eventually just split up and didn't didn't play in the same group anymore. But the cousin was just back here, and I brought them together four times. They helped raise money for the foundation, um, which wow. we haven't even gotten to the yes, foundation yes, yes. much yet. But uh, he came back this year, being the first musician from Niger to ever be nominated for a Grammy. Whoa. Oh. I'm so proud of that kid. Yes. So he's he's a world famous guy. But getting back to Mono and That's the Rebels. That's a crazy communication story too. That the guitar <laughs> is yes. the way to communicate and cassettes and boomboxes. And and he, and it was of huge importance. And yeah. everybody knew. I mean, to this day, they know all the Rebel songs. And this was in '95. So I traveled with Mono for t three weeks. And we visited the camps of the people who were who were his rebels, and and these they were nomadic families, and those nomads were helping these rebels survive because they didn't have anything to eat. I mean, I all of the young men that I that I met in those days, and they eventually came here, and we, they would starve to death in the hills because they didn't have. And as a result, they decimated the population, the wildlife, the gazelles, the ostrich, and the military who were out there fighting them were doing the same thing. So it was really hard on the wildlife. And it was really hard on them too. And the women were fighting the good fight, trying to get them you know, food and gas and all of that. But they were just trying to be able to have some kind of rights in their own territory and they never they'd never had anybody in the political spectrum because they weren't educated they weren't enough of them that were educated uh, that's all changed now in fact the guy who runs our uh, foundation now is a Tuareg man mm. who was educated and is and they very, very consciously decided to integrate themselves into the political system so that they would have some con kind of control. Well, okay. Okay, so yeah, so lead us into, um, there's still obviously so much to talk about. Um, some For another conversation, all about getting to more of the political nuance and cultural uh, mm -hmm. preservation and all right. this type of stuff. Um, so then, uh, yeah. So then, how did it, how did it end up the realization that by you know by providing uh, more uh, general health opportunities as well as economic opportunities, it could help um, people. The key, as I said, was that's why I went into the story about the Tuareg. The key was the Tuareg because they had the uh, the the knowledge of the t of the territory and and more of them had educations. Mm. And the, I ended up meeting um, the youngest rebel leader from that rebellion, brilliant guy, who to this day, I met him in 2005, he is still our representative. And he and I, working together, um, have devised ways that are, are realistic, and practical. I was winging it with the foundation initially, mm -hmm. and we did start the first school that the Wadabi had ever had, mm -hmm. and because they had told me they wanted it, but I, but it was, uh, and and it's still it's still running today, but I didn't really have a plan. I was just doing little things that, you know, people seemed to need. I'd buy cows for people mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. What got me into the realm of having a plan and a system was meeting Sidi Maman, who is our, our, this rebel leader, who is just a brilliant man. And that led us into, as I told you the story of trying to find a nomad when you've got the head of household mm -hmm. in your car, mm -hmm. it's not an easy thing. And that's why nobody helps them. That's why no, no humanitarian organizations work out there because it, there's no bang for the buck. It's too hard to, to drive around and spend a whole much, bunch of money and vaccinate 14 people. 
you know, it's just not practical. So they want to have the good statistics. Meanwhile, these people are left out in the cold. So what we decided to do was they're the mobile ones. Let them come to us. And there's one migration route. There's an area that's known for, the, it's called the Cure Soleil. It's a salt cure. It's ha mm. where all animals, the pasture is very rich and salty, mm. and animals have to have salt. And so they all come to this one area, and they pass by this one area. And all the nomads in the whole country try to get to this area because that's where their animals are going to get really healthy mm. to make it through the long dry season. Okay. And so we were given a well mm -hmm. on this migration route and decided, hey, because we were given the well, it gave us the right to build something there. Yeah. You're never going to get a nomad to go into the city because they believe that you go into a city and die. because when they have serious health problems, they wait so long until they're so desperate that they do go into the city and it's too late to care for them, so they die. Mm. And so it's this catch-22. You don't go into the city because you're going to die there. Well, so we decided we're going to build these things in their comfort zone, on their migration route. We built a medical clinic. Mm -hmm. And the first, uh, the opening of the clinic in 2009, 2009. we treated over a thousand patients in a week. None Whoa. of them had seen a, a, none of them had ever seen a doctor. They were just desperate. Now, a lot of it was not real useful work because, because in the culture, the elders are respected. The elders got to come in first, and they're going. Oh, I have, I have aches and pains. They have arthritis or cataracts or things that we couldn't really do anything mm. about except give an aspirin, and they think that aspirin is miraculous. So, but we did get to the point where we were treating some real things, and we hired a, a local person to start treating them. Well, over the the years. We stopped having to do medical mi missions where our doctors were treating the patients because they had care all the time. There's the staff, the clinic is staffed. Mm -hmm. And so they don't have these health, this desperation. But we did find that the, the, the one group that was really at risk is pregnant women because they're not going to get on a donkey to come to our clinic when they go into labor. So coincidentally, I meet this uh, obstetrician in Ojai who's, who's retired, and his life is about service. And so he really wanted to get involved in this program. He invented, uh, he devised a midwife training program. We selected women. Uh, they hadn't really had any, any experience particularly but they were competent women who were respected. And the communities selected them. And what you, you have is a woman from a, an extended family group that will move with that family group. And she would come into our, our training center next to our clinic and learn what to do. And the big deal was prenatal care. But what we discovered after the, the first two training sessions was, and I lost five friends in childbirth. They were not their first children. It was the maternal, uh, these women died, left orphans, and we couldn't figure out what this, what is this? It was, the country has a very high maternal mortality rate, but there are not really any statistics for nomads, so um, we didn't really know, but I knew personally I lost five friends. So when we started this program, we realized that um, what was killing them was dehydration. They, as a culture, don't drink water because they live in the Sahara Desert. And in order to protect your community and be cooperative and not be greedy, you limit your water. And that's a cultural stricture. And um, when we got the community behind it and they, they want to protect their pregnant women, we pretty much cut out maternal mortality with, there were a lot of other things, but that was the biggie.
and such a surprise. Yes, the when you were telling me this yesterday, it was so beautiful learning about it from you. First of all, it's crazy interesting that you had to set up the general health clinic on the migration route near the, the salt pasture, mm -hmm. which is where you knew that there would be um, uh, the nomads migrating through mm -hmm. and that they would stop and get general health uh, needs taken care of. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant that that's like that's a way to 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 make it to make general health uh, advancements mm -hmm. set it up right there at a, at a key point on the migration route and then also that i remember when you were teaching me about this i had this you know this overwhelming feeling of like beauty that that it's 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 so beautiful that there's so much um selflessness that happens with with water restriction because you want the um to 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 provide for others and that uh at the same time that uh having a little bit more um, abundance with water prevents the dehydration which prevents the the maternal mortality mm -hmm. so again another one of those like wow moments that that hydration can save lives mm -hmm. and so then um so then how did that end up uh um end up progressing because you you were teaching me that there's your your you're teaching um, one of the uh, members of the of the indigenous tribe to then um, be trained in midwifery skills to assist with um, the birth process for mm -hmm. other tribe members. Well, we have programs where the, the 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 communities select the women. They come into the Thomas Na Center, Adult Education Center. We started with the medical clinic, which kind of gave us. Everybody knew we were there because they weren't going to go to the city to get health care. They wanted to come to us. And so that gave us this recognition. We started a boarding school where the kids are allowed, are, are, we feed the kids, we, we pay the teacher, we pay the s supplies, the, but the par and we build the school. But the parents have to care for the kids, provide the caregivers they stay at the school. That's the only way nomads can get an education is to be able to live at the school because they don't live in one place. Mm -hmm. So our training programs are uh, a group of, now we have 37 women working that are um, trained by uh, doctor, originally the doctor that devised the program and now there's, he retired at age 85 from our program, wow. but he went for six visits before that. And now we have a, a doctor, uh, OBGYN, and her midwife sister, and they're continuing the training. And they're, it's all based on, on reenactment of the, we have the, the midwives, there are five languages spoken here. Yeah. And these are illiterate women also, so you're not gonna give them reading material. Yeah. You either do things by pictures or you reenact. Yes. And it can be so much fun. It's we're now a whole yes. all all woman team. The the <laughs> clinic director is a woman. The two doctors are women. I am, and all the all the midwives. And then you know, we get them up there and say, okay, tell us what you do on the first prenatal visit. What do you ask the patient? Yeah. What do you give the patient? And they have they go through the whole process. What do you do on the second prenatal? So we ha have them do three prenatal visits, and then. And then the big thing is preparing for an evacuation if it's necessary, because you know there's some a lot of things they can't do, but they can take blood pressure. Huh. So they've learned they can't do anything about it, but they've learned how to take it and know if, that this woman is at risk of preeclampsia, which is a result of high blood pressure in pregnancy, and it can cause death. And if, if she's got high blood pressure in her pregnancy, get her next to a hospital when she's gonna deliver. And they've, they're doing it, they're doing it. We haven't lost one woman in, our, in over 2,000 births since we started, and that, we, we have lost three that died as a result of malaria, but that was after they got to the hospital. Wow, a 2,000 total, no, no yeah. deaths. Wow, 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 wow. And I, the statistic for the country was one in seven. Uh, that was what it was, yeah. 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 And now, 
But the nomads have never had statistics. I just had this anecdotal thing, personal experience of yes. losing five women. But now we have these little reports that the women can fill out. So we know how many women died in the, or none, but it's, that's part of the column that they have to fill out. They put their mark down. They, I draw a little picture of a, of a dead woman and a dead baby or a woman that has fever, a woman that mm. has, mm. Um, uh, what are the other things that are on the report? Anyway, we have statistics now that have never been available for nomads because these illiterate women are making mm. out their reports. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very wow. successful program. I'm so proud of it, I could burst. Yeah, yeah, 37 <laughs> total. Um, yeah, functioning. Functioning. Uh, we call them traditional birth attendants. Traditional birth attendants. Um, or in, in, in Niger, they're called matrones. Matrones. Mm. Wow. And also the fact that they go off of memory, that they store this in their memory, they're not writing it yeah, down no and looking taken. at notes, no notes. Yeah, yeah, just go through the process enough times yeah. until you've solidified it. Um, wow. And okay, so this is one of, of many of the, so, gen, so the General Health Clinic, um, there's also um, the foundation, Nomad Foundation is also working um, on economic opportunity in general as yes. well. And yes. so you do cool things like, like, like buy incredible goods, um, uh, and then that have a deep cultural meaning, um, and then you bring them to Ojai in this gallery, and you share um, it with other people and share that message. Then all the other cool things that you're teaching about the adult education programs, motorcycle repair, solar panels, earth bank buildings or storehouses, cereal banks, microcredits. So this is a lot of different optionality for economic opportunity. And so teach us about how that's been going. Um, well, I've, you find that I see a lot of big organizations focusing on a specific thing. And if you um, cure malaria, for instance, you end up having a lot of people that didn't die, but those people need to eat. They need to have jobs. They need to have educations. You can't just, I feel very personally, I feel, that you have to address all those things or else you're missing the boat. And so one of the big risks in the area has been uh, that the young men without opportunities, uh, and they, a lot of them were in rebellion before, and so the only skill they had is with arms, uh, are being re recruited into terrorism because they're surrounded by Libya, Algeria, Mali, countries that are, Nigeria, the countries that are very rife with terrorism. So we wanted to give them some kind of opportunity so they don't have to do that, because they don't really want to do that. That's dangerous. Yeah. They'll get killed. It's not, and they, that's not what they wanted. I mean, even the rebellion, using arms in the rebellion is not what they wanted to do. They did it out of necessity to, to survive, you know, for the survival of their culture. So. We did a lot of programs addressing young men. Microcredit was very successful. Mm -hmm. They, if they have something to do at home, they won't go across the board. And they've always had the habit to go to Libya or Algeria, which are very oil rich countries. And that's where they could find jobs. Now there aren't any jobs, it's just terrorism. And so they, in order to stop them from going there, you give them a $200 loan. Most of them did this very brilliant thing. Nomads don't live next to the grocery store. They have to go send their donkey or their camel for a week to go and get grain or tea and sugar, which is terribly important to them, um, in the town, the mm. nearest town. So these guys would, would take their $200 and buy a stock and get it transported to where their families are moving and that is um, that gave them they'd sell it at profit it would be a big advantage to the families because they weren't spending all that time to get in to do their own shopping mm. 
And so it gave them some profits and we, we recirculated those loans for about four years. And as soon as they pay back the loan, in, they'd, they'd have six months with the $200 loan, they'd pay it back and they'd have some little business going and somebody else would get the money. Mm -hmm. And so they, we had, we've done over 200 loans. Nice. That, I mean, that kept, that kept 200 young men yes. from going into terrorism. Yes. We did, we found that they really like motorcycles because they're mm -hmm. faster than camels and they cost about the same as mm -hmm. a camel and are a little bit less than a camel. Problem is, you got to put gas in them, mm -hmm. so there's something that you've got to pay for, and mm -hmm. you got to repair them. Mm -hmm. They don't just eat pasture, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. you don't yeah. just take care of them like they know how to take care of camels. So anyway, we did announced that we were going to do a motorcycle repair training, and we had funding for 20 because we wanted to buy tools for these guys that were trained. Got a local guy who was a really good mechanic that I've known for many years, and he said, yeah, I'll do this, this is great. Um, but 40 people showed up and 40 more wanted to want to the training. We yeah. could only give the tools to 20, but this next year we're gonna do it again because already five of those guys who were in that training are making their living repairing other people's motorcycles. Mm -hmm. And it was you know, a two week training and yeah. they have yeah. the tools and they can, you know, they're, they're cruising now. So, um, the solar panel, those uh, project, we taught them how to build solar panels. They, we kind of hit a snag and all of the projects that I've done have been, or the foundation has done, you're going to have plenty of failures and that's how you get yeah. better. Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, the big failure in solar panels is they could build the panels. They knew how to, to solder the little photovoltaic cells together. And the only thing we had to bring in was those photovoltaic cells. Mm -hmm. We made the frames and had the glass mm -hmm. and the backing and the wiring and all of that local. Problem is you can't get very strong glass there. So they made these beautiful panels. We had schools electrified. We had our center electrified by our students. We had gardens electrified. The panels only last a couple years because the winds are so strong, the glass breaks. So what they were very successful at was small charging things for cell phones. Uh -huh, okay. um, but it gave them this, this knowledge yes. of, of solar. So a lot of them are working for solar companies now yeah, yeah, yeah. and or they're doing their own little projects that uh, are solar related. So you take what you can get, you know, you, some is perfect and some, the midwife is almost perfect, but it mm -hmm. takes a, annual revision and supplying them with the things that they need. And, and, you know, you just hope that most of them are successful. And then what do you see now with, you know, approaching now the year 2020 and the way that um, we're making advancements with all of the exponential technologies on the, around the world. Um, and we're also trying to desperately like preserve indigenous wisdom because we know there's so much important understanding of the interconnectedness of us with our planet and the ecosystem that we live in and how to treat it spiritually. So how do you see this interplaying in the, in the future, the way that we um, engage with um, indigenous tribes around the world, help them with economic opportunity, general health, but also learn the, some of the philosophies, some of the spirituality, some of that indigenous wisdom as well. How do, you, how do you see that interplaying? Well, technology has been a major thing. Most, most nomads have cell phones. Um, nomads, generally, they're still very, there's a 70 plus percent uh, illiteracy in Niger and higher than that among nomads. So they're not um, able to, you know, type out stuff on a computer, but they all have cell phones and they use WhatsApp, so that's, Whoa. which is vocal. And yeah. so they can, and they have, they do a lot of social media stuff. They're, they have Facebook and they have groups that, and they're, nomads are major communicators. When I, before cell phones, you never 
let a camel go by without stopping that camel and asking what what the pastor was like over there or what you know was on the road or what you're always always communicating they the cell phone companies had no idea how much this the nomadic population would would subscribe to cell phones huh. huge but it's not about you know getting them out of their culture it's about hey have you seen my camel yeah or what's the, is that a disease oh can you get vaccinations at that place it's about it's it's really a lot about preserving their culture yeah. and it's easier to communicate in that way than you know walking down the path and running into somebody haphazardly mm -hmm. they still take it upon themselves to communicate those important things but they do it through cell phones mm -hmm. and i don't i mean it's not because it's still largely illiterate it's still um i don't think the, immediately they're going to lose their, uh, because they're tremendously proud of their culture. And I don't, and, and so few nomads have, have uh, immigrated out of their country because they love their country. Mano Dayak told me, he was killed by the way two weeks after I left him. But he told me a nomad always returns to his first camp. And he's been all over the world. But he came back, and he snuck into the desert to lead the rebellion because he couldn't come in, in publicly. So they are wed to their, their desert and their pasture land and their herding lifestyle. And even though some of them live in cities and some of them have gone to college, I have our solar engineer that does all our, our solar work at, the, at our, our center went to college in France, but he installs solar systems for nomadic families and every summer he comes back and spends his vacation with his nomadic family all uh, they live in this symbio symbiotic relationship with the people that that move that live in the city and sometimes the city people are doing better than the nomads and sometimes the nomads are doing better than the city people and they just but they really cherish their traditions and that I don't think is is going to go away right away. It's still around, and I believe that when we're ready to, with I'm probably not going to last forever, like <laughs> so. I'm going to keep doing this as long as I can, but I want it to be ready to turn over to them, and and let them continue with what they've always done, but have a little bit more better health care, mm -hmm. have a little more opportunities. The kids who are being educated in the school, they're going to come back and be the director of the clinic and the director of the school one of these days. Mm -hmm. They don't want to leave. They mm -hmm. want to work mm -hmm. where they mm -hmm. where they have always lived. Yeah, the other things that were coming through me during that time was that by doing something like having a big database of all the voice-to-voice -voice communications that they're now doing is a way to preserve the language over time. Um, and that, that's versus uh, having, if, if, in, if a certain indigenous um, tribes disappear from the face of the earth um, and all the culture is gone with them, we will, it's so hard to go back and try and do any sort yeah. of archaeology to identify that. Right. So to actually at least have a record of human beings existing, the way that they communicated, all this type of stuff. Yeah. There's a bunch of important projects going on, like um, the Rosetta Project with the Long Now Foundation, things like that, um, that are at least trying to preserve the the languages that have been spoken across the planet, yeah, things like that. Very important. And it's good that, like you said, that um, that there's an increase in general health that um, prevents mortality. That um, these types of things, uh, an education of of um, that can get children to to come back and be the director of the school or the clinic afterward. That type of stuff. Mm -hmm. Interesting. There's a lot of nuance still to understand about the way that we can take some of the indigenous wisdoms and really embody them in this exponential technology age that we're, that we're bracing towards and also the um, way that we can most effectively have links like you were this link um, that made it easier for us to, that you took a lot of big sacrifices, uh, leaps of faith, uh, in order to become this link that then made it easier to, um, to provide the general health and the economic opportunity increases. So to 
figure out that is going to be is going to be interesting in the next couple of decades. I want to see if um, there were so many cool stories that you taught us about along this journey, and that was still just like a tiny bit of the cool stories. Well, wait for my book. Wait for the book. Yeah. So that'll be another episode, with Leslie. Will um, hopefully twenty twenty next year. Hopefully mm-hmm. is the. She'll be traveling, painting, writing. That's the plan now. Mm-hmm. This was the the beautiful uh, last day actually in the gallery after 23 years yeah. in Ojai of bringing all the beautiful um, paintings from around the world that you ended up um, uh, illustrating for, for people to bring into their homes. Um, and so, okay, does it feel like we did a good job covering the first piece of the conversation. I feel like we did really well. I think we did. I think we did really well. (laughs) Leslie, you're so, so cool. Um, I want to ask you just, um, let's do two quick questions on the way out. Um, The first question was a little bit out of left field, but do you think we're in a simulation? What do you mean? Like, do you think that reality is a simulation? Who knows? I mean, everybody's reality is different. And the one thing that I've learned about when I step into nomadic life and those, the people, I've learned to never think I know anything. Yes. Just experience it and don't impose what I think I know. Yes. It doesn't work. Yes, the Shoshin, the beginner's mindset, the... Mm. humility carrying that with you at all mm-hmm. times yeah. yeah yeah especially to oh. to be able to learn from people around the world yes yes mm-hmm. and okay the last question is what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world the most beautiful thing in the world is <laughs> is beauty i mean what it's like i can't there are so many things that are beautiful and the only thing to me that and the and the king is beauty itself you you have to for me i i have been accused or not accused but people say oh you must be so observant because i paint a lot and i can paint from life from from what i see i am not I am focused. I extract the beautiful from what I see and that it doesn't matter what it is. It is it is the essence of something that just fills my heart and I, I that's what I want to depict. I've ta- taken friends into to Niger and and we're sitting watching this beautiful jarawal and they're going, "You smell that dead donkey?" I didn't notice the dead donkey. You know, it's, mm. it's, I focus on what I, and I choose to make things beautiful. Mm-hmm. That's my, my mm. choice in life. And I, and I won't say there's any one thing that's the most beautiful thing in the world, because everything is, if you make it so. Yes, yes, yes. <sighs> that's a very valuable, very valuable takeaway that we can add beauty to, to all of our different life experiences and have our perception be um, uh, geared in a way that enables us to see that, that beauty. And I love how you said that you take this, the essence of what's going on in that moment and then that you um, find the beauty in that and you bring it onto a canvas and that that's your, and you bring it to other people <laughs> to share it with them. Leslie, thank you so much for talking to us on the show, for coming on. It's been my pleasure. We're very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) You're so cool. I'm so excited to to do another show on on the book when that's done. Everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you think about, about indigenous wisdom, about nomadic tribes about bringing general health also bringing economic opportunity please let us know your thoughts in the comments below also do check out the links in the bio below as well nomadgal.com as well as nomadfoundation.org check those out and go and support the artists the entrepreneurs the um the different spiritual leaders 
the organizations in your communities around the world that you believe in, support them, support simulation, support our show so we can continue doing cool things like coming on site to beautiful places like Ojai and talking to awesome people like Leslie. And also, go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace. That's a wrap. That's <laughs> a wrap. That was so we fun. Did it. <laughs> that was so fun. You're so awesome.